Hi, it's Adele, and I feel so privileged to introduce you to Denise Stoughton, who is a product designer, and how all about creativity, what she uses it for, how, how it comes about, and personally, I don't even know what a product designer is, so she's going to tell us all about it. <laughs> so here's Denise. <laughs> well, not many people do know what a product designer is. Oftentimes, I get asked, well, what is that exactly? And it's so funny to me because everything we touch during the course of our day is a product. You wake up in the morning, you make yourself a pot of coffee. What are you using? A coffee maker. That's a product. Someone designed that. Someone picked out the color for it. So your bedding, anything in your home is a product. So there uh, are actually little elves like me behind the scenes designing these products that we use in our everyday lives. And I specifically focused on home textiles during my career. So, and it is something I went to school for, believe it or not, at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, there's a home products development program. It's a very small program, but it addresses the need for product designers in the home categories, which are divided into hard goods and soft goods. Soft goods are anything made out of textiles for your home the bedding, the table linens, the shower curtain, the towels, uh, deck pillows, all of it. And then the hard goods are all of the other things like frames and accessories and glassware and dinnerware and all of the gadgets. So that is a big industry in the United States. And so there's a need for a lot of designers. And since moving to Bainbridge Island, which is where you and I both are right now, and we love it. I um, And having moved away from New York City, which is where most designers kind of work and live and most of those companies exist, I decided to make my own line. So talk tell us about, about that. <laughs> yeah, tell us about that. And then I also am interested in, um, as far as when you talk about the soft and the hard you know, products, is it that you design the colors for it um, as far as the soft, the textiles, or do you, you know, and then do you design the, or create the design for the hard? I mean, and how does that even start or where do you I even know. begin? I know. Talk about creativity. I Where's know. the starting point for yeah. creativity? Yeah. Right? So when you're doing products, there is a definite beginning, middle, and end. And you are definitely addressing certain markets. So say your market is mid-America and you know that you're designing goods that are going into Bed Bath & Beyond or Target, or that would be the middle, right? It's not high end, it's not very low end, it's right there in the middle. So you have to know your target audience and your customer base. For me, it was always Bed Bath & Beyond, Kohl's, Target, uh, all of those retailers, JCPenney's for instance. So um, when you start the development process and say it's home textiles, I'll just use that as an, an example, um, you design everything. So you ideate the product. So let's just say you're working on bedding as a category. That's your category. And so everything that goes into that product, the pattern, the color, the cut and sew, somebody has to tell the person, does a button go over here? Is it ruched? Is there a bow? Is there a flange on the end? And so for all you home sewers, you'll be familiar with all these terms. Is, is there beading on the pop pillows? You know, there's always the neck roll and the euros and the regular standard pillows. So they all have dimension and size and fabrics and uh, other components that go into making the final product. Um, so you start with a concept. A lot of designers go to Europe and travel to the shows in Paris and different places to get inspiration. And being that I did most of my work in New York City, no shortage of inspiration in a place like that. And so you Yeah, that's start... what I was gonna ask you is where you get your inspiration for all these. So traveling and then just yes. where you are in the, you know. And I love to look at other things. I love to look at art. I like to look at fashion especially women's accessories for all the little design details. And you just have to keep your eyes open 24 seven. It's just an occupational hazard. I mean, you could be walking around looking at anything. <laughs> oh, look at that leaf. I love the veining and the pattern. Why don't we do that? You know, <laughs> so you just can't turn it off. So the inspiration is just a matter of having your eyes open all the time. 
and then putting yourself in places where you can be inspired. And so hence the trips to Europe, you know, to a show like Maison Ayabje, which is just a feast of the eyes. And, and also, where is that? It's in Paris, and they do it twice a year, September and January. And so that's a beautiful place. And then, of course, while you're there, you want to shop all of the retailers and go to the galleries and the museums. And I would usually go to London at the same time and do the same thing there. So you're just constantly a sponge and absorbing what you're seeing. And it's subconscious how it translates into your work, but it does. And I just trust that it will. Well, and you've been in this business long enough um, that for a long time. So you know, you know, the trust builds and the confidence builds. Right. And there's a, a continuum, right? You're not working in isolation. There's things that came before what you're doing and will come after. Right. So you have to have an awareness of what's happened and you're just riding that wave. So say last year something was really popular. Well, you're not going to repeat that this year. So you're moving on to the next thing. And that's what I love about it. It's always fresh and new. And I always want to be like ahead. And I think as a product developer, you're usually two or three seasons ahead anyway of what's actually in the stores now. So you're always what's next, what's new. And I like that. You know, I don't ever want to be stuck. So I like looking forward to what's happening and bringing something fresh and new. And it's hard because let's face it, none of us are reinventing the wheel, but what is our interpretation of something at any given point in time? So, and the other thing too is, um, I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, the products in your home and just being in the kitchen, and I don't know why this came to me, but I was thinking toasters. And when you look at, I think I've been to, you know, like some museum somewhere along the way in my life, and you see this evolution where they have what they used to look like in the eight, you know, forties, fifties, yes. sixties, and the evolution, it's, they're fascinating. They're works of art. You they know, really are. It is fascinating. And there's a museum I want to say in London, that has home products through the decades. And funny you should mention that because I coincidentally taught a class at FIT uh, called America at Home. So I took the students through all the decades, starting from the 19 aughts, you know, the 20s, the 30s, and 40s. And what were those factors that impacted design at any given time? Was it war? Was it political? Was it economical? Was there a shortage of money? Or was there a lot of money? Um, did we go to space? That really impacted everything. Everything looked so space-like in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And so there are reasons why things look a certain way, and we don't often sit down and think about it. But there are factors that impact the products in our home and why they're designed a certain way and why they're certain colors. That's so interesting. And I was going to ask, that was going to be my next question is um, the, de the physical design of it is one thing. And then you've got the colors. And the first thing that comes to me is when I look back is that avocado green that used to be all oh, over so people's popular. <laughs> <laughs> but also back then what was popular were like mushrooms and certain motifs were very popular back then too. And so it all kind of played together to a more ma natural palette. I would say, you know, the greens, the browns, the oranges, it was very, very natural. And um, the other thing I want to mention too, it's not just the design and the color, but technology. Mm -hmm. So as we advance in technology, our products change. Uh, consider the phone as a fabulous example of that, which everyone yeah. can relate to. Yeah. I mean, and just look at how not only the phone, but even the computers and, you know, exactly. and all these things. And when I, when I, when I think ahead, project like, what are things going to be like? We don't even, even know. Even it's in exciting. five years. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, think of what the phone is now, what it'll be in five years. If only we had a crystal ball, right? Because then once you see it happen, you say, oh, of course, of course, that was the evolution of that product in retrospect. But it's hard to just anticipate what that might be. Yeah. We'd all be billionaires if we could. <laughs> I know. Now, are you working on something in particular right now? Yes. Is there... 
Tell us Always about that. working on yeah. something. Uh, this year has been so exciting for me because, um, and this is where creativity comes into play. And you and I have talked about this a little bit because we've talked before. Um, sometimes a life event will kick off a creative spurt, let's say. And so that's what happened to me here on Bainbridge Island. Um, it was a separation and I went back out on my own again and I had to reinvent myself. And so it required a lot of energy and to be a little fearless and to set the ego aside and say, you know, what do I have to offer? What can I do? And I live on a small island. I'm not in New York City anymore. So when I went out on my own again at 51 or two, however old I was, um, I just decided that I had, it was sort of like a game. I had everything available to me. In my mind, I just made that true. I love that perspective. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, when you start something new, if you don't have that, I mean, it's a lot of effort to start and do that. And especially combining creativity and deciding everything you're going to do. So, yes. Yeah. So, so it's really hard and you have to set your mind to it. It's just like, do you want to decide to paint? Do you want to decide to do carpentry? And, you know, you have to put that energy out there. So I put the energy out there in a way that I decided everything was possible everything and anything. And I wasn't going to worry. I felt as long as I was doing something every day and putting the energy out that I would get something back. And when did, when, uh, so has it been a couple of years since that It's been transition? 18 months. Wow. So right away I decided I would design my tiny little apartment in such a way that it was, uh, good enough to be photographed because I do interior design and product design. And so that would be my little calling card, my first portfolio piece. So I went about making this beautiful space for me to live in. I had it photographed. I made a website. And in the process of doing my apartment on a budget, I decided, well, let me go see what Home Depot has. And I went over to Home Depot and I saw these cool little magnetic planters. You just can put them on a fridge. You know, everybody's seen things like that. And I thought, well, these are really nice, but they could be better because as a product developer, you're always like, remember what I said? What's yes. new? What's next? <laughs> What's the next generation of this product? So I went over to the building supplies area in Home Depot and they had sheet metal. And of course the magnets stick to that. And I started playing with the shapes of the sheet metal and magnetized planters. And um, so I made some for my apartment. And I remember they were four square sheet metal, just silver with these planters on them and I put them in a grid pattern. And when I had a cocktail party to invite all my friends over to my tiny little place, they were like, what is that? Those are so cool. And the pots pop off because they're magnetic and you can put anything in there. So someone said, well, you should sell those. And I looked at them and I said, you know what? I could sell those, not in this form, but if they were done properly, I could sell them. So I started collaborating with various people on this island, a metalsmith, a powder coater, and I kind of at that moment started what is now the modern airhead line. Modern airhead. Yes. So a year and a half later, it's sort of like a fan favorite on the island. A lot of people know them. They're sold at a store locally. And what I love about these products, they're obviously vertical planters that hang on a wall, but they're powder coated in really wonderful colors and metallics and they're different shapes and sizes so a customer can come in and buy whatever they want and create sort of a modern scheme on their wall of planters that's that very is... geometric and fun so that's i've seen nice. these look any number of different ways depending on who buys them so that's fun for me is offering some like it's almost like a little toolkit like here you go and do what you want with them so and you're basically saying, so you, you, it kind of, it sounds like you have these basic tool, you know, these basic parts mm -hmm. and that they can basically and create whatever, however they want, a whole bunch of them or one yes. or, and are they for real plants? Yes. 
Wow. So I think that's so fabulous. Well, I designed them initially for air plants, hence the name Modern Airhead, which works on many different levels. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can put faux yeah. plants in there. A lot of people do that because I've had people tell me they will actually kill an air plant, even yeah. though they take very little effort to keep alive. Yeah. So I tell them there's no shame. Put in there whatever you want to put in. So since designing this line, it's got a lot of momentum and almost a life of its own. And that's very gratifying to see something that I design go out there. And in a way, that's much more gratifying than when I did it for the big companies because I would often go into a Bed Bath & Beyond and see a handful of products that I designed you know, in the bedding department, in the window department, in the table linens department, in the bath department. And that was very gratifying. You know, you go in and you see your touch on everything and it's being sold at a, a very high volume, right? There's, they're everywhere. And so, yet I'm just so much happier with this little product line that's starting very small and that I have a high touch, right? I'm touching every part of the design process in a way that I wouldn't when things were manufactured overseas that I worked on. So that's been fun. And it also dovetails very nicely with my interior design business. And it keeps my name sort of out there in a nice way because everybody's familiar with the product line and I do interior design and it works well. Well, I love how you just described how an idea, you know, went from Oh, I could do that better, seeing something. I could do that in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so then you actually went and did it. So many people might have an idea. And then, and of course, with your background, you knew what right. to do and where to go, you know, find the materials and who to talk to. But so many times people don't follow through with that and it just ends up nowhere. Right. So I love how you saw something and then just the progression of steps where, and now you've got this final product and it's, it's very creative. Not only are you very creative, but mm. it's creative where you can mix and match them and decide, is it, are they different colors? And the, you they're know, all different colors. Well, I think when you start out with an idea, you have to have a fearless determination to have it done because so many people say, oh, I have this great idea. And then you ask them about it a year later. Oh, yeah, well, I moved on to something else or I didn't do it. So it has to be something that you kind of stick with. And it's not easy. No. You have to be patient. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's where some people might lose the momentum because it's not that immediate gratification, certainly with product development of yeah. any product. It is months, you know, and... Well, and you have to test the market, like with almost any business or even even with art. When I mm. tell my students, you know, um, I try to tell them, just keep going and keep going. Don't put everything, on, you know, into one painting. You've got hundreds of paintings in you. So look at the overall, basically, statistic. And right. it's, it's a marathon, it, not a sprint. That's right. It's not overnight. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything um, that you see developing from, you know, the planter that you have now? Yes, because as you could imagine, I can't just let it be what it is and stop there. So I have learned a lot about metal and the properties of metal and how chemicals or other things impact the metal. So uh, my original planters are a stainless steel, a 20 gauge, and now I've started using core 10 steel which many people may know is the weathering steel that rusts and architects and designers love using it on the exterior buildings and on the interior buildings because it gets that beautiful patina. You can accelerate that by using uh, vinegar and salt water. So I've started doing the same planters, but with the core 10 steel and rusting it myself and then you seal it. And it's just a whole different look. Whereas the modern airheads are very sleek and modern and bright colors and happy colors. This is very earthy and so much more about the material and how it weathers. So that's one permutation. And then uh, typically they have ceramic pots on them, but now I've been collaborating with other artisans in the area uh, to create wood vessels for the air plants. And in some cases we're starting to do glass vessels but they all work with the same system of vertical metal planters because they have magnets on them. So it's interchangeable, so it can evolve, not only the colors and shapes, but the type of pots that you put on them. So I wouldn't say it's endless, but I think it'll cycle through for several years to come. 
And um, then just last month, I was tooling around and I saw um, these tables that were being liquidated. So I'm upcycling some furniture now. So, you know, if you're a creative person, you just don't stop. No, and I love how you've taken it. It can be whether it's a painting or something three dimensional, like you mm -hmm. know um, your planners, and then the table. It's the the concept of creativity isn't in just one area. It basically it can strengthen in all the areas. So you become yes. and you gain confidence. The more yes. you you know, it's like oh okay, that kind of worked. Or even if it didn't work, you might keep yes. tweaking it and tweaking mm -hmm. it. You don't give up. The first right. time something doesn't work. Right. Well, you might have little small successes and hopefully you do because it spurs you on to do more. You don't want to get depressed and not want to get out of bed um, in the morning. But yeah, I think the creative process for some people is not an option. It's there. It's like a program that's running in the background all the time and you just have to activate it. And what would you say to those people who f say, I don't have a creative bone in my body, what would you tell them? I would want to slap them <laughs> <laughs> and say, if you're alive, you're creative. That's really the thing. And that's what I, the message I keep trying to give out to the members of my community and to the world is that we all have the creativity. We yes. all have it. It's just it's, it's there. It's just accepting it. Right. We're creative by default. Yeah. We get up in the morning, we're creating something. We've created a life. We've created a family. We've created a career. Uh, we create so many things and we do it unconsciously, right? But then there's a difference of that and conscious creativity where you decide that you're going to harness that in some way. And the conscious creativity is very different. Yeah. You know, that yeah. is very focused and that is saying that's looking at the world in such a way where you are uh, curious and you're examining things. And then there's a physical manifestation of that creativity at the end of it, Yeah, whether it be a painting or an object. So that's a lot goes into that creativity. And yeah. for some people, it's just a battleground. So if you had to answer this one question. How would you define creativity? What would you say? I would define it as an energy, an innate energy in us that we consciously develop where we, without having a choice, I think some of us don't have a choice to create. You know, that we look at the world in such a way where we think about things, we turn them over a bunch of times, and we have opinions and thoughts that we feel we want to express. We have to express them. And that's a process. I mean, it's they call it the creative process, and everybody's is different. Um, but for me, I think that's it. I just, my mindset is a creative mindset. It's an energy that I feel, and I feel, additionally feel the need to express it externally, this internal dialogue with me and the world. I love that description. I love that description. Well, mm. I have had so much fun <laughs> talking with you. I now have a much clearer picture of what a product designer is. And I'm going to give everybody, I want everybody, I'm going to link all the, um, the website and all the information for Denise below. And I just want to thank you so much for coming, for doing this interview, for talking about creativity and telling uh, me and everybody else all about product design. It's a very fascinating um, field. Well, thanks, Adele. I was so happy to be here yeah. and have the opportunity to talk. Great. Thanks, Denise. You're welcome. Okay. Okay.